Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good. Uh, so good to see you all this morning. And um, brilliant to see you at Ravenhill. And if you're here for the first time, you're so welcome. And um, we hope you feel at home. And my name is Marty, and I'm the minister here. But this morning, we're delighted to have two uh, guests who have come from a little bit further than the rest of us. And that is Aaron Moore. Aaron, do you stand up and just give a quick wave? So Aaron is here. He's the pastor of Eastminster Presbyterian Church in Marietta in Georgia. And then we've got. Chris Kovac, where's Chris going? Chris Kovac, uh, that's Chris, he is from uh, West Highland Baptist Church in Ontario, Canada, and this morning you'll be delighted to hear that Aaron's preaching, and uh, you'll be even more delighted to hear that you don't have to hear me in the evening either, as Chris is going to preach in the evening. So can I encourage you to do come out tonight to the evening service, and do come to hear Chris this evening. But this morning we're here to meet with each other, and we're also here to worship God. So let's take a moment of stillness, just as we set our hearts to come into his presence and worship him. Lord, this is a day that you have made, and so help us today to rejoice and to be glad. Would you remind us today of the privileges that we have as your people, to come to you in these moments, to confess our sins, to receive forgiveness, to pray and sing and listen, and to be renewed in our walk with Jesus. Oh Lord, this morning as we gather here, would you open our eyes to you? Would you open our ears to your word? And would you come and meet with us by your spirit and help us to celebrate your son, our savior, Jesus? Lord, this is the day that you've made and we're so glad to be here. So help us to rejoice today in who Jesus is. We pray in his name, amen. Well, we're gonna stand together and sing our opening hymn, Psalm 150, which encourages us to praise the Lord and lift our voices. So let's stand together and sing.
Heavenly Father, we're here today and we are full of gratitude and full of praise. We want to thank you today for the many blessings that you've given to us and for all of the love and the grace that you've shown to us. We praise you for your goodness and mercy, for your faithfulness and your steadfastness. We marvel at your creation and the beauty and wonder that's around us. We give you thanks for this wonderful gift of life that we have and for the many opportunities you've given us to grow and to learn and to enjoy. We're grateful for the people you've placed in our lives and for the relationships that we have with them. And today we offer you our worship and our adoration for you are truly good and you have truly blessed us. But Lord, as we come before you in praise and in thanksgiving, we also come before you with hearts that are aware of our shortcomings and our failures. And we confess this morning that we have sinned against you. We've not always lived up to the calling you've placed in our lives. And so we ask for your forgiveness and for your grace today. And for the strength and the guidance to turn back towards you and to follow in your ways. Oh Lord, help us to turn away from the things that lead us astray. And help us instead to embrace the truth that only can be found in you. We pray today, Lord, that we would grow in our relationship with you and that our hearts may be transformed by your love. May we live lives that honor you and glorify you and bring joy and blessing to those around us. Oh Lord, thank you for this time together this morning to be reminded of your grace and your love. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we do confess our sins every week when we come to church, but we also are reminded of the wonderful grace and the forgiveness that is ours in Christ. And just to remind you of that, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which is just such wonderful news. Well, this morning I've already kind of introduced our guests, but I'm going to ask them to come to the front line. So Chris and Aaron, come on up. Um, Take a, well, maybe don't take it off, but you can grab a mic. It's almost perfect height. Yes. Yeah, it's spot on. Oh, I like it. Again, he's getting the lingo. So, uh, guys, just for a congregation, tell them a little bit about yourselves, who you are, your family, where you're from. Just a little introduction so they get to know you. And then I'll tell them if you're being honest. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well. No. Nope. Or do I need a mic? You need a mic. All right, I need a mic. So yeah, as you already said, my name is Chris Kovac, and I'm from Hamilton, Ontario, which is just about an hour outside of Toronto. And I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I came to faith at university when I was about 21 or 22 years old. And um, I've uh, gone into ministry. I've been in full-time ministry now for 21 years, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a pastor of evangelism at a church in Hamilton. And uh, I'm married. I've been married for 22 years. And I um, have three kids, a 19-year-old son, uh, an 18-year-old daughter, and a daughter who's going to turn 15 the day after I get back from this trip. So uh, three, yeah, the Lord's really blessed me with a uh, great family and, and uh, salvation and the op opportunities to serve him day in and day out. So um, anything else I'm leaving out? I'll ask you more questions. All right. Good. Yeah, all right. Good morning. My name is Aaron Moore. I am from originally from North Carolina. Uh, I serve at a church now in Marietta, Georgia. Both of those. Someone, somebody asked me, "Is that on this side or the other side?" And I didn't understand the question. Uh, but yeah, so that's on the, the eastern coast of the United States. So we're closer to you than California. Uh, just so you know. Uh, so my wife and I we met in college. I'm a, I was a music major in college, and the Lord called me into ministry. And uh, I've been in, I've been in the church uh, since since I was saved, which when I was about 19 years old when I gave my life to Christ. Even though I was raised in the church, I didn't know Jesus uh, as, as, as Lord uh, until I was around 19. And he, he, uh, he found me, and, and uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a journey since then. I met my wife in college. We have four children. My oldest is 19. I have three sons, 19. Um, my second son will be 17, about two days after I get back from, uh, from this trip. Then I have a 13-year-old son and an 11-year-old daughter, and uh, yeah, so that's 
Did I say I've been married 23 years? 23 years. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that. Good, good work. Keep it going. Keep it going. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I guess one of the questions I'd like to ask is, coming from your context, what are your kind of greatest encouragements in ministry, or your greatest encouragements from what you see in in the church or in the life of the church? And I haven't I haven't preempted with these questions, so they're thinking well, that's a big question for yeah. on this one. Just something that's something that's encouraging for you guys um, from your contexts. Because we have a lot of discouragement here, but we also have things that are encouraging us. And what's, what's encouraging me? You know, I, I don't know necessarily from my context, but just, I think being able to travel just a little bit, I don't, I don't get all the way around the world, um, even though this trip has taken us to, to Singapore, but seeing the, the body of believers uh, all over the world, that we, we have many things that separate us. You know, there's a lot of things that divide us, and yet when we come into worship, uh, there's one who unites us, no matter what our differences are. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys are aware, but America is a very fractured, uh, a fractured nation right now, uh, with, with political fractures and racial fra fractures. And, and uh, when we come together, you know, those fractures are, are, are present in, in our congregation, and yet we, we focus on the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. And that, to me, is encouraging. Though, though we, we, we come from different perspectives and, and persuasions, we can't find uh, unity in the body of Christ. And so that's, uh, that's encouraging to me. Thanks. Chris, what's encouraging you at the minute? Well, nothing. <laughs> in terms of ministry? Like in terms of the church or in terms of ministry or in terms of what you see God do? In my own context. If you want. Okay, all right. Well, I, I think it would be two things. One is we're in the, in the middle of kind of transferring from a what I would call a program-based uh, approach to ministry, where you run programs and you have people shuffle through the programs to a disciple-making culture. And so we're probably about four years into that, and uh, we're gonna see a, kind of some significant changes in the next probably year to 18 months. And so you'll hear a little bit more about that as you come back this evening, I can expound on that a little bit. Um, the other thing is, you know, being a pastor of evangelism, I just love seeing people come to faith in Jesus. So um, I think since I've been there, I've been at this church 11 years, we've seen, I don't know, about 750 people come to wow. faith, um, like maybe first time professionals. So that's been a privilege and a joy. And we're a bit of a bigger church, so it's not, it's, I mean, that number is probably 50 to 100 a year. So it's it's encouraging to see people coming to faith and, and their lives being changed and transformed. That, to me, that's what it's, it's all about. So. Yeah. Well, I got another couple questions, but before that, any do any boys and girls want to ask or guests anything? Oh no, <laughs> Joshua. <laughs> Joshua, what do you want to ask? Chris, have you ever seen a bear in the mountains in Canada? <laughs> yes, I've seen lots of bears and moose and wild horses. Uh, yep, yeah, I've been really close to a bear, like from here to. That pew oh. out in the wild, so it was a little bit, a little bit nerve-wracking. Yeah. <laughs> was there any other questions for our guests from Canada or America? Anything else you want to ask them? Yeah. So what's the weather like where you both are? Tell, tell them what the weather. Oh, it's paradise. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, if you go, if you get out to Florida, I'm sure many of you have been to Florida. Florida's very warm. You know, shorts and flip-flops all the time, and then you get the further north you go. I'm sure it's like this as well, but you know, it gets colder, but it's very similar. You know, we have rain and, and snow, and yeah. But in the summer, what's your what's your average temperature? Oh, it's warm. It's yeah. quite warm in the summer times. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I, I lived in South Florida for for a little while, and uh, the difference between North Carolina and South Florida is that it doesn't get cool at night in Florida. You know, it's it's it, it's only around. 75 or 80 degrees most of the time on average, which is really nice, but at night it just doesn't drop. Uh, in North Carolina, it may be 90 degrees in the day, and then it drops down to 70 at night, so that's the... Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Yeah, Fahrenheit. sorry, it's not like that. Chris, do you want to tell what it's like in California? Well, we have four very distinct seasons. So summer would be, night. we have about three months each season. So summer is nice and warm, about 30 degrees. But when I left, Canada, it was minus 25. Uh, so that was pretty cold. Yeah, so our winters are very cold, our summers are nice and warm, we have a nice fall, nice spring. So very, very distinct four seasons. Okay, boys and girls, any other questions you want to ask them? Okay, Tom. 
What celebrations do you have like that are different from here in America and Canada? Well, we uh, we have a very important celebration, which which may rub some folks in here wrong uh, wrong a little bit. We, we celebrate uh, Independence Day on um, July the fourth. <laughs> so that's that's probably a celebration that, that you guys don't celebrate here. It's uh, American Independence. What about in Canada, Chris? What do you celebrate there? Well, we celebrate Queen Victoria Day. <laughs> wow. Um, that's one of the days that we celebrate. You guys have that here too. No, no, no. Okay. Do you actually? That, we do. Yeah, I thought it was a joke. No, no. <laughs> Queen uh, Victoria Day. Queen like, Victoria yeah. Day. Uh, we have Canada Day, Queen Victoria Day, uh, a holiday called Family Day. Uh, so those are probably the different ones. Wow. Uh, can I just ask, sorry, just for fun, what do you do on Queen Victoria Day? What do you do? <laughs> We don't do anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just a day off. <laughs> uh, I, I, okay, we're, uh, we're, we should wrap this up, but I'm, I'm, I mean, in terms of the doctor ministry stuff, what's been your most kind of, what has that been for you? What's been, what's been your most encouraging thing about the doctor of ministry? Studies. Meeting these two guys right here, I think, has uh, is, is been the most frustrating part of it. <laughs> No, it has been a joy. This is the third time we've, we've actually got to get together in person, and uh, each each time we've, we've really hit it off. And the, the, the joy of coming together for intensive study for two weeks, this will be 10 days, uh, it's, it's very life-giving. You know, uh, you, you will experience this when Marty gets back from Singapore. He will be filled, his cup will be full. Uh, I'm confident of that because it's happened each and every time. So that that is... Um, that's really the, the best part of this, is that the doctor ministry is out to make us better pastors. And uh, I'm confident that that's happening with Marty and Chris as well. Chris, do you want to share I would concur with him. And yeah, it's been great to get to know the people in the course, especially these two characters. Um, and then, you know, I, I went into this program because I kind of had plateaued as a, as a pastor. Uh, I needed some more inputs to stimulate my thinking. And, and so this has done that for me. Just the books that they've been making us read, the papers that we've had to write, the conversations, it's been good. Yeah. Good. Well, we're going to pray for you guys a little later on, but thank you for coming to Northern Ireland. Thank you for preaching today, and we're looking forward to hearing it later on. So, well, let's continue to worship God as we stand together and sing, not come now is the time to worship.
So as I've said, we're meeting together tonight at 7 o'clock again, and I encourage you to come out tonight to hear Chris as he opens up God's Word for us. Also tomorrow night, just to let you know if you're coming to the PW, that Paul Trimble from Skywatch, which is Civilian Air Patrol, will be there, and that's on tomorrow night at 7.30. Um, and as you've gathered, I'm going to be away um, from tomorrow for a couple of weeks. I'll be back on Sunday the 22nd. Um, I just encourage you to pray for our travel as we go to Singapore tomorrow, and to pray that it would be a refreshing time for me. And if you need a minister, John's here, and the, the, he's got the radio mobile phone, so you can contact him on that, or you can also contact Dennis or Clark of Session over the next couple of weeks. And I'm going to invite Clive up now, who's going to make an announcement. Clive, you need a microphone? Sorry. Sounds good. What he always says, um, he always introduced himself as being the, the minister of this church, so I'm, I'm saying, try around the treasure. Um, just as we start a new year, um, I just want, on behalf of the session, to uh, thank members of the congregation for your continued support and your continued generous support of the free will offering during 2022. Um, you may or may not know that one of the criteria for having reviewable tenure status removed from Ravenhill back in November was that the Linkage Commission could see an improvement in our church finances. So thank you um, all for playing your part in that. Um, a special thanks too for those members who have been able to increase their contributions in recent years um, despite the rise in cost of living which is affecting us all. If there's anyone in the congregation um, who wants to start contributing to the Free Will Offering during 2023, you can do that through the envelope scheme or you can do it through bank transfer. Um, if you want more details, please speak to me and I'll give you all the information that you need. Um, we'll have a new numbering scheme for free will offering in operation this year. Um, because there's, since COVID, quite a few members now don't use envelopes. So we'll have actually a separate numbering scheme for those people, um, as well as the normal numbering scheme if you want just to continue to use weekly envelopes. That's no problem. Um, another great benefit to the church is gift aid. And if you are a UK taxpayer, um, either through your employment salary or through a pension scheme you may have, then you can be eligible um, to sign up for gift aid. Um, gift aid means that um, the church can claim 25% more on the top of your contribution, which you make to the church. If you wish again to sign up for gift aid, um, or if you can't remember if you ever signed up in the past, then please speak to me and I'll be able to put you straight. Um, you can sign up to claim gift aid for last year for any contributions you made during 2022. And again, this is a great help to the church. Um, finally, can I thank all those members who have contributed um, in recent years to the Minister's Bursary Fund. Um, this fund is currently being suspended, as we believe we have enough um, finance um, to allow Marty to finish his um, Doctor of Ministry Studies. So again, if, uh, if you were intending to make a contribution to that in the weeks ahead, um, um, please don't, um, as I said, we don't want to have too much money in that fund, we'll have more than enough. Good um, to hear. I'm <laughs> told Marty tells us what he's doing next after he passes his uh, training, and uh, we'll, we'll maybe start it with again. Um, again, if there's anybody have any issues regarding, any queries regarding finance, please do speak to me. As I said, um, finance is very important, I know we're all going through the same. Um, cost of living um, situation at the moment, but uh, if you can, keep supporting the church and through your finance, that would be great. Thanks very much. Clive, can we just thank you for your work as treasurer? Um, Clive does uh, a lot in our congregation, as you all know, but the work of treasurer really is a very demanding role. And uh, poor Clive has responded to emails and reimbursing people, doing all the stuff, all the accounts, and it's, it's an awful lot of work. So, Clive, thank you for all you do. <laughs> uh, well, um, this next amount, now I've got some mixed emotions uh, because our much loved women's worker, Angela, is resigning from her post to take up a job in Church House. And her last Sunday in her role will be Sunday the 22nd of January. And we're just so grateful and so thankful for all that Angela has done to support and encourage women in our church. 
and also for what she's done to connect with women in our local community. And we're just so pleased and so delighted at how the Lord has used to hear in Ravenhill over these past three years. Um, your passion for Jesus, your love for others, it's really encouraged us and it's really inspired us. And uh, we're really sad that you're, you're leaving the role. But we are delighted that you're not leaving us. So although Angela is finishing her role as women's worker, she is going to be at Ravenhill and still part of things and still around and still here on Sundays and still very much involved in the life of the church. Um, and I'm just, yeah, just want to say, I'll, I'll, I'll do it in the 22nd properly, but thank you, Angela, for, for all of you. <laughs> One way I'd like us to show appreciation to Angela is just to be able to give her a small token uh, on the day that she leaves. And so if you'd like to contribute to that, please just put some money in an envelope, label it Angela, and put it in the buckets next week. Or if you want to give uh, to that via uh, bank transfer, if you just put Angela as the reference or something like that, and we can do that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's sad news, but we're also uh, delighted for you, and we're, we'll be prayerfully supporting you as you start your new role. So let's take a moment and we'll pray for Angela, and we'll also pray for Chris and Aaron, and then we'll sing again the boys and girls before we go forward. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today so much for Angela, and Lord, we just pray that um, as she gets ready to finish her role with us and move to her new position in the Presbyterian Church, that you would bless her. Lord, we thank you for the ways in which Angela served and ministered to this, our congregation. We thank you for how she served the women in this congregation and also the women in our local community. We thank you for the ways that she's encouraged and supported us. And Lord, we thank you for the example that she set for us in following you with her whole heart. And Lord, we would just pray for your guidance and for your direction as Angela takes on this new chapter in her ministry. May you lead her and guide her as she serves you in this new capacity. And Lord, we pray for your protection over her and for your provision of her all her needs. And Lord, we would ask that you would bless her in her work and that you would use her to make a difference in your kingdom. Father, we pray to you that Angela would continue to grow in her relationship with you and that she would be a light for you wherever she goes. Lord, we ask that you would bless her with your peace and with your joy as she begins this new journey. Lord, we pray for Angela this morning, trusting in your goodness and in your faithfulness. And Lord, we're going to thank you this morning for our friends, Aaron and Chris, who joined us from far away. Lord, we give you thanks for their lives and for the ways in which you're using them to serve your people. And Lord, this morning we pray for their families, that you would bless them and keep them, and that you would draw each of them closer to you. We pray to you this morning, Lord, for their ministry, that you give them wisdom and discernment as they lead your people. And Lord, we pray that you would use their gifts and their calling to make a difference in this world for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray too for their doctor of ministry studies, that you give them understanding and insight as they grow in their knowledge and understanding of your word. Lord, we ask this morning that you would bless Aaron and bless Chris in all that they do, and that you would use them to bring glory to your son. Trusting in your goodness and in your protection, Lord, we ask you bless them and keep them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, you can head out now to Forest uh, if you're in P6 or above. And at this stage, I'm going to hand over to my friend with the, the Southern Draw, Aaron. Come on up here. Uh, I think we're going to, I think he's going to read the Bible passage first. Oh no, we're not. We're going to say, sorry, yeah, we'll sing first.
to be in worship with you this morning. It's, um, you know, it's a very different context, and I, I love the flute. Thank you. Uh, it reminds me of Ireland somehow. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, we're looking at verses 1 through 12 today. I don't know if you're um, aware, maybe you are, this past Friday, two days ago, was Epiphany. This is the liturgical celebration in the church, the commemoration of the giving of, of light and grace to the Gentiles, specifically in the story of the Magi, the Gentile Magi, coming to visit the Holy Family in Bethlehem, which is our our story today, and notably, Epiphany is also the deadline for taking down your Christmas decorations. So if you haven't done that yet, you want to you take care of that this week. Uh, the story of the Magi is a, a very brief uh, story, but it's an epic, it's an epic journey. It really is a, a story of miles and, and searching, of, of curiosity, of discovery, and it's, it's a story about extraordinary faith from unlikely people. Now, faith always comes from unlikely people, but it's, it's good for us to be reminded that, uh, that faith is an extraordinary thing. It is a gift that we are, are given by God. And so today, it's good to be reminded of the, the motivations of, of faith that are given to these unlikely Gentiles in the story of the Magi. Again, this is Magi chapter 2. Verses 1 through 12, listen now, sisters and brothers, to the very word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least of the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to hear it, they returned to the country by another route. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. May God add his blessing to this reading. For this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You guys ever been to a surprise party? Do you do that in Ireland? Yeah. You ever planned a surprise party? It takes a lot of, of, of forethought. It takes a lot of planning, maybe some, some secrecy. Everybody's in on a secret. My very favorite surprise party we ever threw was for my wife. It was a, it was a bridal shower. Um, I don't know if you do, do, you do bridal showers here. So it's a bride, we're going to give a bunch of gifts to the bride. And so we were in Richmond, Virginia, which is just, just north of where we are in North Carolina. It's about a five-hour drive from Virginia to North Carolina. Her parents were in Virginia. And we were finishing up lunch. We had gone to church that day. We are finishing up lunch. And, uh, and we changed clothes. We were getting ready to drive for five hours back to North Carolina, so much so that, that we said our goodbyes. We changed clothes at the restaurant. Now, we got in the car to drive back to North Carolina, and I had a sudden memory. Now, I didn't want to lie to my wife, so I didn't tell her I forgot my Bible. But I told her, I, I, I remember I left my Bible on your mom's nightstand. And then to try to put in the hook to, to make it her idea, I said, 
Do you think we should get her to mail it to us, or should we just pull on by and pick it up? Now, if she had said mail it, I'd said, well, aren't we I would have found a way to get there. But she said, no, let's, let's go on by there and pick it up. I said, that's a great idea. Let's, let's do that. And so here I am with my wife, and we're driving back, and, and, and her mom doesn't know that we're coming. And, and we get to the house, and we walk in the door, and surprise, there's people everywhere. There's streamers, and my wife is confused. She just doesn't get it. How did they know we were coming back? You know, she just, I just it, it, it took a few minutes for her to get her bearings before she finally put the pieces together that her loving fiance was in on this surprise. Well, this story, God is in on a surprise for these magi. He's going to surprise them with overwhelming joy. This is the title of my sermon today, The Surprise by Joy. It's a... Uh, um, the words joy or joyful or rejoice is a major theme in the scriptures. It, it, this word occurs more than 430 times in the Bible. We come to the story, we don't get a lot of background on these guys. We, we just open to Matthew chapter 2 and surprise, here, here are these guys and they're, they're looking for the king. One, the baby who, is, who by virtue of his birth is, is born king. And prompts, or should prompt, a critical question for thoughtful believers. Why would three, and let's just assume there are three, there's three gifts. There's a lot of speculation. How many wise men were there? We don't know. There were three gifts. But let's just assume there are three guys. Why would these three Persian astronomers, these magi, why would they travel 800 Miles. That's how far it was from, from Jerusalem to, to Persia. That's like from, from here to Amsterdam or here to Iceland. 400, I'm sorry, 800 miles. Why did they travel 800 miles to worship the king of the Jews? Now, there's a lot to unpack with that question. And I want us to consider a few motivations. What, what, what might have motivated these guys to go and worship this child thing, no, king? First, surprises, of course, take time to plan. 400 years prior, 450 years prior to this event in Bethlehem, the wise men, 450 years prior, the Jewish nation was not in Jerusalem. They weren't in Israel. They were in exile in Babylon. Babylon, of course, became Persia. The Jews were in exile for 70 years, but the Lord had told them, you know, this, don't, don't get irritated with this exile. I want you to settle in, you know, build houses. He told them, uh, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry, have sons and daughters. They're in exile. This is a, this is a judgment for, for, for generations of rebellion against the Lord. The Lord judged Israel. He put them into exile, but the Lord never abandoned them. He was always good on his promises. But he said, while you're there, I'm still going to bless you. While you're there, you still can find the stuff of joy. Settle down. Plant gardens. Have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city in which I have planted you in which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. It's a good way and a good reminder for, for us here in Belfast to pray for Belfast, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now, eventually, the, the Jews who were in Babylon, they came back from captivity. They came back to Israel, but not everybody came. Some of the people stayed. They, they intermingled with the Babylonian culture, and it is quite possible that the descendants of Israel, that these, these, Babylon, these uh, Magi could have possibly been descendants of Israel. At the very least, they could have been influenced by the descendants of Israel who still believed in a coming king. So the first possible motivation for these magi coming is that they had influence from other believers. Other believers have spoken to them. There's going to be a ruler one day. There's going to be a, a, a king, a messiah who will come, who will deliver us from our sins. So first motivation is the influence of other believers. Now the second motivation, the prophet Daniel, and he was also in the exile, he wrote a book. 
And in that book, he wrote a timeline. He told them in chapter 9 that there's going to be 490 years until the ruler would come. And you take that timeline, and then you take all of the Advent scriptures that we just read. You guys read Advent scriptures in the month of December from Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah. You take all of those scriptures, you put them together with an astronomical phenomenon, and all of a sudden, there's something to look forward to. There's something to seek after. The second motivation is the Word of God. They had the scriptures of these prophets. You know, they, they, they had the influence of believers telling them that that ruler is going to come, and then they go to the Word of God. God can work with these influences. So the first one, influence of believers. Secondly, the Word of God. And as there is often with our curious search for the Lord, there's always something else at work. Not just other people telling us, not just what we're reading and but, but the Lord is at work in some mysterious way. Now, dreams and visions are not ubiquitous in Scripture, but they were in Luke chapter 1 and 2 and Matthew chapter 2. These people are having visions everywhere. The angel Gabriel is coming to speak to the Virgin Mary and to John the Baptist, or his parents. Uh, the, the, Joseph is having visions. They both have dreams, Joseph and the Magi have dreams at the end of chapter 2 of Matthew. And all of these dreams are the Holy Spirit prompting them to something else. And so we have three possible motivations. We have the influence of the believers, we have the Word of God, and we have the prompting of the Holy Spirit, both internal and external. But here's the thing. All of those promptings, are these enough? What does it take to get someone wise, to leave their home, to, 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 to gather great gifts of wealth, to travel by foot, maybe by camel, 800 miles. This is like a five or six month round trip to worship the child king of another country, of another people. Can you imagine the Irish? getting enthusiastic about an English king. <laughs> Which is why it was so incredible and surprising that the Magi are so motivated. This is a big trip. Have you ever met a brand new Christian? You know, somebody who's, who's, who's just found that the life of Jesus Christ is, is all they need. They're, they're on fire. They're hungry for the Lord. They're ready to charge hell with a water pistol. You know, I, I don't know if you've met some of these folks, but when you meet someone like that, it's, it's easy for us who have been in the, the Lord for a while to, to kind of get uneasy around the excitement. You know, it's, that's, it's a little much. We're not sure. And if we're not careful, we can, we can have a little contempt for their excitement. Maybe we can, we can put a, 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 wet, a wet blanket on that excitement. And, and we got to be careful not to, uh, not to do that. You know, uh, it's a joy of new life and new hope. It's a, it's a surprise of, of, uh, of salvation. And we, want, we don't want to discount or discourage the energy or the joy of new believers or show contempt for their enthusiasm. This is what's going on. The Magi are excited. They come to Jerusalem. They meet with the religious people and the king. And they say, where is the child who is born king of the Jews? And it's interesting that these farms, these guys are not Jews. They're Persians. They have more excitement about the fulfillment of prophecy than the religious scholars, than the Pharisees and the scribes. And I imagine that sinking feeling that the Magi must have had when they arrived in Jerusalem and they were told, the baby's not born here. You're not going to find him. You've, you've come all this way for nothing. You're going to have to travel five more miles to Bethlehem. They've come 800 miles, but they only have to travel five more miles to Bethlehem. We were touring the North Coast uh, in, uh, yesterday, and we went to the Giant's Causeway. And if you've ever been down that path at the Giant's Causeway, it's, it's so long. It's like 10 miles. And, and, and we, were, we were walking, and I was thinking, you know, it's, it's bitter cold, and the wind's blowing, and I'm not really properly dressed. 
And, and so I'm thinking, okay, we're going to round this bend, and it's going to be right there. <laughs> and so we rounded the bend, and, and it's like three miles still that we have to walk. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this, this better be worth it. <laughs> and it was. You guys live in a beautiful place. Uh, and we took some amazing pictures. The Magi arrived in Jerusalem. They've come all this way, and they've got this little short distance to go. Five miles. But five miles. That's how far Bethlehem was from Jerusalem. That's how far the scribes and Pharisees, that's how far the religious people were from their Messiah. That's how far away they were from their salvation. And yet they weren't seeking after him. They were content with their religious routines. They were content with just doing things the way they had always done. And these Persians, excited, full of faith, they want to see the fulfilled prophecy. The Apostle John tells us, Jesus came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. This is a miracle. These Gentiles who don't belong to the family of Israel are coming to worship the king of Israel. They're coming to find the Messiah. And they become children of God because he loves us like that. How often do we miss the movements of the Lord because they do not look the way we expect them to look? Is it possible that we have grown stale in our walk with Christ, in our religious routines, and, and perhaps grown uninterested in, in, in the way that the Lord is working and, and being present when he's actually doing things in our community? Why did they make this trip? Was it the influence of the Babylonian believers? Was it the scripture? The religious people in Jerusalem had all the same information. And they were only five miles away from Bethlehem, and yet they didn't make the trip. Was it dreams and visions? Was it that internal prompting? You know, for believers who are already walking with Christ, this is the stuff of, of discerning the will of the Lord. How do we know the will of the Lord in our lives? Well, these three principles apply. It's, it's, it's the influence of other believers, the influence of the church who see things in your life that perhaps you don't see, who can tell you, look, I think the Lord is calling you into ministry. It's the word of God when we, when we seek God for answers and we go to the scriptures and we find them. It's that internal prompting of the Holy Spirit who, who sometimes tells us and, and opens our, our, our eyes to something we never thought about. You know? uh, maybe God wants you to go into the ministry. Perhaps the Lord wants you to be a missionary. You've never thought about that. Well, if we, don't, we don't go by one of these alone. If the Lord says, you know, I want you to be a, a missionary, and you think, well, I need to hear from, from the scripture, and I need to hear some of the believers affirm that in my life as well, but how do we discern the will of God? The same way these magi were discerning that it's time to go to Jerusalem. For the magi, making that kind of journey on the basis of a star alone didn't make sense. It wasn't just the star, it was acting on it. Not just the influence of people in Babylon, but acting on it. Not simply reading the truth of the scripture and Daniel or other prophecies, but stepping out in faith to find out if there's something to it. What does it take for someone who does not yet believe to choose to go the distance to seek after Jesus? You see, we all have the same information. We know the story of the birth of Jesus. We know the story of his life, his teachings, his death and resurrection. We know what, what the cross has done for our lives, for our atonement, for the forgiveness of sins. We know what the resurrection has done to give us new life, to live in the righteousness and the holiness of God. We have the influence of our families and friends who've walked this road before us. We have the scriptures at our fingertips. We might even have dreams of Jesus. What does it take for us to gather up all these motivations that we have been given and take that first step or that next step of faith to, to join that class or that men's or women's group to, to, uh, to start 
that journal or, or, or open the Bible and begin reading? What does it take for that next step of faith? To, to get alone with God away from our devices or our cell phones. I don't know if that's as much of a problem in Ireland as it is in the States. It's, we always have this thing in our, in our hands. What does it take for us to put that down for a while? To get alone with the Lord to, to call out to heaven for answers and then to open the scriptures legitimately seeking to, to find answers to those questions. Are we with the curious magi who would go the distance to find out if it's all true? Are we more like the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees? We've got this. We've settled into our routines. We have the information, but we'll let others see you out. So let me close with this thought. You know, the Magi, they, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. They were delirious with happiness. I tell our people sometimes, are you filled with the joy of the Lord this morning? And they say, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, still, well, tell your face, you know. They say, the joy of the Lord is in this place. We don't have to walk five miles. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us right here in this place. When we take steps of faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, we discover that God had already taken crucial steps towards us. We love because he first loved us. We look around and see how God has been ordering our steps, surrounding us with influences that would bring us to this place, allowing us to, to hear the word of God, to be fed by the Lord, inviting us to take that journey of curious discovery. The Bible says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Ask, seek, knock, for whoever asks will receive, whoever seeks will find, whoever knocks, to them the door will be open. Surprise. It's for you this morning. Believe the good news of the gospel. The Lord loves you with an everlasting love and has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be born into this world to save us from sin and to give us new, victorious life. This is the life we have in Christ. Amen? Let's pray today. Father, we do thank you. We thank you that by your grace you have saved us, that you have redeemed us. That by the work on the cross, Lord, you have atoned for our sin. Lord, it is not by works lest we boast. By the work of your son, Jesus Christ, and because of that we praise his glorious grace. Lord, we look around the world and certainly it is, it is broken. So many suffer from disease and sickness, from war and famine. Lord, we cry out to you as your people. We cry for mercy. Help us, Lord, to be your hands and feet where we may. That uh, for the suffering that we see before us, that we might rise up and be the hands and feet of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, for those of us who, who are on the edge of, of seeking you, we're not really sure if it's all true or not. Lord, give us the faith to, to take that next step. Lord, allow us to, to have the curiosity to find out what else you have. There's always more. Your grace is so great. And we are so not. And so fill us, Lord, with your spirit that we might live victorious and holy lives. This we pray. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And God's people said
you know, what a beautiful, beautiful people you are. And now remember, sisters and brothers, that you go nowhere by accident. But everywhere you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. You who are in Christ have something that God wants to do in you and through you where you are. So believe this and go this week embracing your families, your communities, this county, city, this country. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. And God's people say. Amen. Amen.